written about us had been written by non-Indigenous people. And then for sources, they're looking at what did the white army officer write in his journal, which might be important historical information, but it's certainly not Indigenous perspectives or Indigenous information, right? And it's not just the history books. It's also like the economic development plan. It's the <laughs> substance abuse intervention plan. It's the school turnaround plan. And we find that, you know, a place like Cook County is not alone in the broader American experience. We have racially predictable disparities in the nicest places of planet Earth. And those racially predictable disparities are in our education systems, in our law enforcement systems, in economic outcomes. Of course, these things are all connected to each other in all kinds of different ways. But as a result, a lot of times we're kind of scratching our heads saying, how come us good people who really care aren't able to engineer the kind of fairness and equity that are right there in our self-stated value systems? And I think the answers to that are complex because we're humans. We didn't, we don't get to like, paint a brand new picture. We inherit a picture people have been painting on for thousands of years and we get to paint on it so we can shape the picture, but we can't control every part of it. Cause I think honestly, if any of us could totally remake the world today, we'd all make some changes, right? And so here we are trying to evolve something that's not totally in our control and we are um, dealing with barriers and wirings in our human psychology that make it harder. Like actually most of what's hardwired in our DNA, like fight, flight, fight, responses to perceived stress, those things are not designed to make us happy or to engineer equity. Those things are designed to keep us alive when there's a saber toothed tiger jumping out from behind the rock, you know? And they work for a lot of those things. They even work like when the bus is whizzing by and you're ready to step out in the street and then, yeah, you know, and you jump back and it, it saves you. Not always, right? But as a result, today we don't even have time to understand a person, much less all of these complex systems. Right? Going back to caveman days, if the saber toothed tiger jumped out from behind the rock, we don't do a thorough intake and think, oh, well, this creature looks like it weighs about 350 pounds. And, you know, I'm, I'm at about 160. And, you know, well, it seems to have large teeth, kind of sharp claws. And um, history has demonstrated that it's possible it could attack me. So I, I think the wisest response might be, run you don't do that you take one look and you're like run and it's had to be that way but we we make these little microscopic evaluations every time we meet a human being right could be anything from clothes to disposition to are they smiling or scowling could be our preconceived notions about all kinds of things gender Men are more likely to be perceived as a threat than women, with some good reason, you know? Um, but lots of other things too, right? Race. And so we don't have time to learn everything before we have to decide how to be with someone. So you're probably aware of like, that's the, can feed the implicit bias, but it's also like with our systems, you know, sometimes it takes everything we have just to go through our day, get the kids out the door, go to work, round up the kids, get home, or whatever our day happens to look like. And so understanding not just a person, but all of these complex systems which shape and order our lives. You know, we've been dealing with systemic kinds of oppressions for a long time, which to interrupt need a systemic response when most of us can muster enough to get through a day, you know what I mean? 
And so all of those things, before we even get into the issues, make it hard. And so I think one thing is to acknowledge this stuff's hard. Um, we are human. We shouldn't beat ourselves up for the things that we inherited, but we should take responsibility for doing our best to bequeath our future generations with something better than, than we got. So there's all kinds of important work in front of us. All right, so Tom Stilde. I, uh, I get to wear a few hats and maybe I'll, I'll share a couple stories as we go. So one of the hats I wear is I'm on a school board for an Ojibwe uh, medium school where they use the tribal language as the language of instruction. Uh, this one's called Wadupadade. It's one of our flagship schools. It's been going for a couple decades now. And the school has had lots of good press. The Obamas came there because the academic outcomes and other things were so um, compelling. And of course, the kids only spoke Ojibwe to the Obamas and sang to them and stuff. It was pretty cool. And I've seen some remarkable things. Um, the community where the school is located, which is at Rakuta Ray in the Hayward Lakes region. So I'm on a school board for a place a couple hundred miles from where I live. Uh, but I'm the community at large rep. Almost everyone else is a local school board rep. And so uh, I've done work with them for a long time. And other capacities before I was on their board doing assessments of teachers and things like that. I remember one time I came out and I, and I was doing assessments of teachers in the pre-K program and they had circle time. And I was watching as the kids ran circle time. So there's a little four-year-old kid who says, you know, and uh, he's giving prompts to the kids and he had a little felt board behind him. And uh, one of the kids says, oh, he's all got the heck of day boy. So he puts up a little symbol for the sun peeking up behind the clouds. Puts another one up for a strong wind. And so he's just asking questions, you know, what's going on with the weather and getting responses. And I was thinking, I can even get my kids to sit still for supper. <laughs> you know, that they're actually engaged in something like, you know, academic, but also not just reading a script or something. It's really pretty impressive. And they were all operating in a language that their parents didn't know or speak at home. And so I remember thinking, wow, there's something impressive happening here. And, you know, academically, classroom management with the language, all kinds of things. And I've seen, I've been really privileged to see some other really exciting shifts not just with dynamic, innovative ideas around things like education, but with really systemic responses, like Portland Public Schools, which has 58 different languages spoken in the school district. Now, a little different than Cook County. <laughs> and, uh, but they've almost completely eliminated racially predictable disparities in test scores wow. and in graduation rates, discipline, and college matriculation rates. <laughs> Yeah, so I was like, wow, what's happening here? And there are all kinds of things. Of course, there are hardworking humans who care a lot. But among things that they do in a place like Portland is they say, we're just going to talk about these uncomfortable topics every day until it's like the air we breathe. Instead of tippy-toeing around on eggshells, <clears throat> we're just going to gain an awareness, familiarity, um, understanding of many different multiple perspectives on these tough topics, and this will be what we do. So it's kind of like, I think we have an aversion to discomfort, right? And part of this, it's not just Minnesota nice, it's everywhere, but, you know, we see it, it's Minnesota manifestations here where we're so conflict averse that we're communication averse, and we're so terrified of offending someone or exposing an ignorance that it's a lot easier if the teacher's thinking, oh no, Christopher Columbus, if I say this, the Italians will get so mad. If I say that, have you ever seen an angry native mom? What am I gonna do? As little as possible. <laughs> and so the response gets built, not around the needs of the kids, their positive identity development, whatever, it's built around the racial comfort of a teacher. Right? But we're here for the kids. And so it takes some bravery 
And I think two things that I have found to be really helpful in these tough topic, mixed company kinds of work and discussions is that one is just recalibrating our expectations around discomfort. Like some kinds of discomfort are good. What would happen if we expected parenting to always be comfortable? <laughs> right? We would be miserable as parents. People wouldn't even reproduce. <laughs> right? But we don't expect parenting to be comfortable because we have an expectation of discomfort. We know there will be puke, there will be fevers, there will be some up all nights, there will be some cranky teenagers, there will be all kinds of bills. And because that's our expectation, when you fall in love with your kid, well, parenting can be one of the most beautiful and rewarding experiences in a person's life. Our disappointments are inversely proportional to our expectations. For some reason, we have an expectation. This is enculturated, not chosen, but we have an expectation for racial comfort, especially in the white experience. You can travel the world and someone will speak to you in English. You can go live in Europe or have a vacation home in Costa Rica and expect the staff where the official language is Spanish to speak to you in English. You wouldn't even hire them if they did. You know what I mean? And so two things happen. One is that the discomfort of being out of your comfort zone around race, language, and things like that doesn't get exercised. So the musculature for doing it atrophies. And then there's this unreasonable expectation to always be comfortable. So even when someone says, hey, let's talk about race, they're like radical discomfort, I'm leaving. <laughs> right? As you get, or disengagement in many different ways. Ooh, that sounds like an important topic. Let's delegate it to so-and-so. We have one native employee here and they can deal with that. Or whatever. There are a lot of different ways to avoid the discomfort. But like so many things, going to the gym isn't comfortable takes time and you're sore the next day. But if you keep going to the gym, well, the next time it actually helps take some of the discomfort out when you do the same exercise and you can actually acclimate to it. So the discomfort actually feels kind of good. You can habituate to it and then you start getting stronger. So sometimes this kind of work, we have to adopt that kind of attitude. Well, we, we endure the discomforts for our children because we love our children. What if we actually loved our neighbors? What if we actually loved justice? We would gladly experience some measure of discomfort to look out for those things. It's easy enough to say, but it's still hard to do. But the awareness can be helpful as we think about, okay, I'll be brave, I'm gonna lean in, I'm going to the gym, ah, it's leg day, but I'm not gonna skip it, or whatever. All right. One of my kids, I, uh, I got a lot of pictures of my kids in the thing here to share. So this is Evan, kid is a complete riot and, uh, super bright. When the pandemic hit, he was really struggling. Of course, they had all the kids trying to be in front of a computer and he would just change his screen name to reconnecting dot, 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 and shut off the camera. <laughs> and he was doing anything but whatever the teacher had to ask him to do. And of course, even things like the gym teacher were just struggling for relevancy. It was like, go do this exercise and take a picture and send it to me. And he's like, I'm outside all day long. All I do is exercise. What I really want is to have them leave me alone. You know, so that was his, his view. <laughs> I said, all right, you know, and we have, I could share a lot of crazy pandemic lockdown stories because you have a lot of kids and there was all kinds of chaos. And I was trying to teach and the kids were interrupting all the time. Dad, where are the hatchets? It's like behind the door in the garage. And they're back there teaching. My students are like, <laughs> there's always something like that, right? Have a, 
I'd say, you older kids, go run gym class for the little kids. Get out there. And so I hear a bunch of screaming. And they've got, like, ropes tied around the youngest girl. And she's running up this hill. And they're pulling back on it. Dad, you got this. Come on. So I'm like, oh, my God, this doesn't look safe, you know. So we were dealing with stuff like that. But anyways, I said, you know, son, I get you. Like, this is a new uncharted territory for everybody. But you do have to learn something. So, if you know better than the rest of us, you pick the topic and you develop the lesson plan. And I'll give you a lot of freedom, but there will be an assessment. <laughs> and so he's like, okay, I like this. So uh, he said, as long as it's outside, that's good. I was like, there's a lot to learn outside. Go, that's cool. So he's like, decided to start with birds. And uh, of course, his idea, you know, he's, early teenager was to have me get him a bag of bird seed and he put a hat on with a brim and he put bird seed there and put seed in his hands and he'd go outside and stand there. <laughs> you know, I'm like, this is not going to work. <laughs> you know, but he, he would stick at it. He's very persistent. So he'd go like 45 minutes. And then the next day, and I was, I was just kind of watching him to see what was going to happen, but I couldn't believe it about like day four birds started coming in. They would like land on the brim of his hat and they start eating the bird seed, you know? And then they're eating out of his hands. I should actually throw in some of these pictures. I've got, eventually he could step outside even if he didn't have bird seed. He'd go like this and birds go, Doo -doo -doo -doo. it's like Dr. Doolittle, you know? <laughs> and uh, I had books, you know, like you know, on bird taxonomy, field guide to the birds, all these different things. And so he's flipping through those and like, you know, taking some notes. I was like, okay, something's happening. And, and then uh, I said, all right, we'll just do a pretest, you know, your assessment here. So uh, what are you learning? It's like, Dad, all of these birds are different. And they act so different. A lot of people don't even know how different they are. See that one right there? That's a cedar waxwing. That's a little different from the bohemian waxwing. You can tell because of the color striations right here. And then that one it looks kind of like a chickadee, but it's got those other marks there. It's, it's a red pole. And uh, he's going through all these ones. Everybody knows what a blue jay is. They're loud and obnoxious, but actually they're more standoffish than the other birds, except for that one. His name's Jerry. <laughs> and so he, he had all of this stuff, like, you know, patterns, behaviors, you know, male and female bird identification stuff. I was like, wow, you know? And it was a good reminder to me how much we have to learn from the kids that every single one of us has something to learn and also every single one of us has something to teach i've never met a human on planet earth who is not my superior in some way nobody's got it all figured out and one of the things that i've also found helpful you know sometimes the language like in dei stuff has really shifted a lot and so we used to talk a lot about cultural competency, learn about and be competent in someone else's culture, but no one is really going to be competent in anyone else's experience. We're so different just by age, gender, race, culture. It's so complex. Two native people don't experience the same world the same way, you know, any more than two white people experience the world exactly the same way. And so as a result, I think some of the, the language has shifted from cultural competency to just cultural humility. Okay, uh, maybe I'll never know everything, so can you help me understand and being curious and asking questions and what don't I see, what do I need to know, um, and being willing to share of ourselves as well, that kind of thing. And so it was just a good uh, practical reminder about that experience. <laughs> Couple of minutes on me, so there's home, Leech Lake, epicenter of the universe, right there. A <laughs> uh, couple folks in my family tree. This guy was famously photographed with a super ancient face. It's ironic, he got the name John Smith later in life. No connection to one from Pocahontas mythology, which, by the way, there's a lot of mythology around that topic. Yeah. I'll probably give you 15 minutes on that. But if you want, when we get to questions, happy to do it. But he was born in the 1700s. He died in the 1900s. 
Yeah, he, he lived a very long life. So he was here before any white settlement. He died actually in 1922. He was here after soldiers came back from World War I. Yeah. So he doesn't, he's not even the record holder for human longevity, although he's pretty close. Uh, but he was here before, you know, when native people own all of it. And he was here when natives at Leech Lake owned 4% of their own reservation. And he never signed a treaty. In part, the US government claimed ownership of Northern Minnesota because of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, even though he and his people had never sold the land to France or to America. There's so many injustices. This other guy, Wabuji, was kind of a famous warrior in the Ojibwe world. I never really had the tools to talk about this when I was a kid, but as I got older, it did start to bother me more that I could go to school for 13 years in a row, kindergarten through grade 12, to learn whatever I needed to be successful in the world, and none of it had anything to do with me. Uh, yeah. It was kind of like the message being delivered by good-hearted people, taking a humble wage to do one of the most important jobs in the world, was screaming at me through the absent narratives. And the absent narratives were screaming, you and yours aren't important, aren't relevant, don't matter. Because if it was important or it did matter, we'd be teaching about it, or we'd be teaching about it every year, you know? And we've doubled down on a pretty narrow range even of academic skills with mathematics and academic English often to the exclusion of others. I don't know if you remember that old movie, Mr. Holland's Opus, you know? Everyone's singing Mr. Holland's Opus because they're gutting the fine arts program or whatever. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure that that serves very well in many different regards. In fact, when you look at like the cultural stuff, by the way, every time you get two humans in a room, there's something cultural happening. Right? So schools are making cultural decisions all the time. A lot of times we think school is a normal zone. We have a separation of church and state, so we don't do culture in schools. But everything's a cultural decision. Even the decision to say the kids should get up and move to the sound of a bell. That's a cultural decision. It's one, by the way, designed intentionally to condition humans to be good, obedient factory workers even though we no longer have factory jobs to give any of them. But we still keep this as culture. What music do we use in the music program? There's lots of music in the world, but for the most part, you know, it's very white music. And, and maybe there's like, whatever, one Jewish song or something, you know, thrown in, but there's a lot of Christian music, like religious music in a school, secular choir program, right? And it's clunky, but if you think about it, it's almost like even our response in the school is something like this. Oh, these students are truant, so we care so much about them, we're gonna drive to their house. We'll pick them up, we'll bring them to school, right? And we will make sure that they're getting this deliverable. But what we're not necessarily doing is questioning the deliverable, right? So it's almost like we have this deliverable for you. It's a great, big, beautiful bowl of whiteness. And it's so good for all of the kids, regardless of their background, that the truant ones will make sure they get here. We'll give them two spoons full of that, right? But we're not saying, why should that be the deliverable? Why should it be delivered out of a bowl? Why should it be delivered with a spoon? Who should be doing the delivering? You know, how should we go about that process? And what's our process for deciding what the deliverable is and how we go about dispensing it? You know what I mean? So even when you look at like breaking down the systems, good hearted people are like, okay, we're gonna try and we're gonna be nice and we're gonna care 
But for the most part, you get something like, these are our accepted deliverable state standards. Okay. You know, and then we will assemble a committee. Oh, we do want to be inclusive, so we'll get a token representative from the marginalized community to help us sell the deliverable. As opposed to how many of you have ever had to be on a committee at some point in your life? Yeah, that's probably everybody, right? How many of you have been on a committee where the majority of the people are people of color? Yeah, and it's a less common experience. Yeah. And so that speaks to power dynamics about who's deciding what the deliverable might be. And we want a time to kind of workshop some of this stuff out, but sometimes I'll do a little exercise. I would just break people into affinity groups, you know, by race or whatever, and I'll say, all right, define white culture, see what you come up with. And so they're working and stuff like that. And I'll say, don't tell me what you came up with. <clears throat> Tell me how you made your decision. And like a white affinity group will be like, oh, well, we brainstormed ideas. We wrote them all down. Everybody had stickers. We all got three stickers. We voted for the ones we liked. The ones that had the highest vote, we rewrote the list over here according to what had the highest, next, and so forth. So we were fair. We were democratic. We empowered everybody. And there's our nice, neat, numbered list. You know, you might ask like an indigenous group or black group and say, what was your process? Or they might be like, process, I don't know. We just started talking, seemed like, you know, she was saying that, he was saying that. And, you know, eventually, I think we would all agree that these are the main ones. And so I said, all right, regardless of what the things are, why does it tell you about your process? So one, you can define as democratic, you've got voting, you've also got linear, numbered, ordered, process, you know, and then over here, you've got something that might look a little more chaotic, but might be a little more consensus and collaborative based with its process. So then if you've got one person from a marginalized racial community with a predominantly white group, and we assume we make a cultural assumption that the process should be fair, democratic, linear, and ordered. They're already outvoted on everything if they have a different opinion. And they might feel invalidated because their normal process is different. Right? So even the process part's like, all right, we're going to assemble this group. How do you want to make decisions? You know, and even talking about how, like, even when you're assembling a classroom, all right, let's make some class rules. What ideas do you guys want? How do you want to do this? And that can be very different slower, clunky, not everybody agrees, but sometimes slower is faster. Uh, and I know for me, like I get asked to sit on lots of committees and I, well, I'm trying to drop as many as I can because time saturated, but you know, also if I have a sense that I will be legitimately empowered and listened to, I'm more likely to engage. And if I have a sense that I'm there for someone's window dressing, I'm less likely to engage. And so the process and yeah. dynamics, <laughs> cultural dynamics around an organization make a difference to me. Even though I can code switch, right? Like I can do the white way of doing things very well. My academic English is on. I sit on lots of different committees and organizations. I know how to work Robert's rules of order. I'm familiar with my white neighbors. I'm friendly with them. We can do stuff together. It can be great. And then I can switch into my native space. Sometimes it's harder for white folks to code switch because just don't have to. Yeah. And so it's good to have awareness when you're trying to build bridges and community to say, all right, how do you want to go about it? Because um, that can be quite revelatory. Um, and by the way, not better or worse, just different. Right? And so understanding the differences can be very helpful. All right. Sorry, I'm just trying to adapt. The group that's watching online is really uh, wishing I could see more of his face. That oh, my <laughs> face. I'm right here, guys. <laughs> They'll see my backside. 
All right. So a couple of quick questions. And you can just shout out answers. Don't worry, this won't be a shaming exercise. But what was the indigenous population of North America? Actually, that should be the Americas um, at the time of Columbus. So we got a couple BCs in the native world before Columbus, <laughs> before casino, <laughs> before coronavirus. <laughs> All right, so the, the first one, the before Columbus one, how many people do you think were here? I've got a 50 million. Three. I've got a 3 million. I've got a 200 million. Okay, that's good. Appreciate you shouting them out. All right, so what do you think our native population might have been around 1970? Five Must have been less? less. <laughs> All right. How many federally recognized tribes? About 800. Okay, so I've got 800 here. All right. Treaties, how many of those? There must have been quite a few. Unbroken ones? Yeah, where's the laugh emoji? <laughs> so some of these things are harder to document because they weren't really doing a census in 1491. Yeah. And even when we do a census now, there are all kinds of problems. But... Some of our best estimates are around 100 million people. Those numbers well range from 50 million to 150 million. I think those are the general, generally accepted um, numbers. Uh, the population of Europe at the same time, 88 million. There were more people here than there were in Europe at the time of contact. That surprises people sometimes. Capital city of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan, was three times larger than the largest city in all of Europe at the time of contact. That city was London. Whoa. But we have often been messaged about scattered bands of roaming nomads in the wilderness, right? And part of that is not historical, but psychological. America's got a hang up on American exceptionalism. And if the message is scattered bands of roaming nomads, then it means there was room for everybody else. Or that everyone else's coming was not somehow a taking. And this is one of the things that makes it so hard to talk about the history stuff and why some people are trying to shout it down is there's no way to look at the history honestly without understanding that there wasn't room for everyone else. Mm. And that everyone else's coming was a taking. Mm. That is part of the American experience. Oh. Yeah. As is slavery. And so these are like two sides of the same coin. You want to spend the coin and talk America, you got to spend both sides. But a lot of folks only want to look at one. We're always flipping heads, you know, and, and we'll argue. Like one version of America says, land of the free, home of the brave, greatest nation on earth, you know, fair, just, kind, whatever, you know. But there's another one that says, you know, even the states' rights stuff in the Constitution was to make it possible that some states that believed owning other humans was okay and the foundation of an economy united in a nation with others that didn't believe the same thing. Right? Yep. That after 9-11, America was hurt. I don't know if you remember that Toby Keith song. We'll put a boot in your ass. It's the American <laughs> way. We destroyed two whole countries. It had nothing to do with 9-11. Every single family in Iraq has a relative killed by Americans. Did that make us safer? To have millions of people hating on us? Probably made us less safe not to mention the injustice of it all, the inhumanity, the whatever. You know what I mean? 
But if you say that, oh, that's difficult in mixed company, you know? So I, I mentioned this just as a way of saying, you know, it's important to do some truth telling. Like you can't, truth and reconciliation begins with truth. You can't get to reconcile and skip all the reconciling. You know? Now I'm switching here first from the Americas to US census data from 1970. I was native before being native was cool. Some people were worried about what's the government <laughs> gonna do to me? Are they gonna come after my kids? There's still residential boarding schools in operation. That's an undercount. By the way, there's a lot that's been going on with the census just through the past couple of iterations. And some of it's very interesting and very telling. Um, the 2010 census showed 5 million Native Americans. The 2020 census showed 10 million Native Americans. Not because we had that many babies that quickly, but they changed how they do the counting. You used to have to pick a racial category, even though a lot of us have a mathematical equation that describes our racial experience, you know, and ethnic experience and so many other things. Also, Hispanic slash Latino was a separate racial category, right? And it used to be Irish was a separate racial category. Still should be. Yeah. <laughs> but no, in America, for real, they, if someone initially, Irish immigrants were considered non-white because we had a very Anglo-Saxon definition of whiteness. The Irish were excluded and persecuted for not being white. There's a thing called the Black Irish. Yeah. And all of this sounds very weird to most of us today because we think what could be whiter than being Irish or you know, things like that, but that was how America treated that. Then eventually the definition of whiteness changed to include the Irish. Then the Italians were not white. And we passed laws to stop so many Italians from coming here because they're not white and it'll be a takeover from non-white people. Then eventually the definition of whiteness changed again to include Italians. Just from the 2010 to the 2020 census, we moved Hispanic slash Latino from a racial category to an ethnic category where you get a drop-down menu and it's still not very nuanced where you pick white or non-white. Now, if you watch TV or travel, you kind of know this, like, anyone go to the Dominican Republic? Official language is Spanish. Population is predominantly Black. Turn on a Spanish-speaking soap opera from Mexico. Most people have blonde hair and blue eyes, which is also <laughs> speaks to the weird racial pedigree issues going on in Mexico, which is, you know, yeah. one of the whitest countries in all of the Americas, Argentina. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah, I'm just, there are all kinds of reasons, you know, and ultimately, it's just a way of saying this is a complex human landscape. A lot of Americans think Spanish speaking means brown, right? We're starting to shift that, which, by the way, it is more accurately an ethnic category. It has to do with language, like. Hispanic as a label has to do with of Spain. Of course, that excludes the Portuguese and other groups. So we're, that's why they're trying to look at Latino to broaden that into Latin based, you know, but even that is coming under, you know, in terms of labels and so forth, some, you know, re-examination. But in any event, one of the things that's happening right now is we will successfully fold some significant percentage of the Hispanic slash Latino population into whiteness, mm -hmm. which among other things will preserve a white racial majority and our racial oh. caste system. That's ongoing right now. Oh. Not with like Wizard of Oz pushing levers behind a cloak kind of thing, but that is something that socially and policy-wise is happening right now. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, 574 federally recognized tribes there's more to say to like break that down. And I, maybe it's a little bit beyond the scope of what we're doing here, but the US government recognizes tribes with whom they have made treaties. 
and other tribes who have gone through a process to be officially recognized by the U.S. federal government. A lot of tribes were dealing with colonization and land loss, dealing with the British, the French, the Spanish, or in Alaska with the Russians before the United States even existed. So not all have a treaty history with the U.S. By the way, there's some tribes that just even in like the Great Basin area or the um, some of the other Rocky Mountain West areas who just hid out and said, we will not make treaties, we will not make war, we're going to avoid you, and never made a treaty. But the government still claimed land based upon treaties with other tribes all around. <laughs> and then found them like literally in the 1920s and stuff and brought them in and said, here's your reservation. Yeah, so there are all kinds of like, it didn't matter what strategy you had. If you were accommodating, if you were fighting, you're hiding out, there's no way to avoid it all. But, and by the way, in the 1950s, they terminated the federal recognition of 109 tribes. That number went down. Um, over 400 treaties. Over 100 have education and health clauses. As partial payment for land sold, we promise to provide for the health and education of Native people as long as grasses grow and rivers flow. Mm -hmm. So many say these things. It's part of what is sometimes in a legalese called the federal trust responsibility to tribes. This is why there's a Bureau of Indian Education and Indian Health Service, not a special right for a special interest group, partial payment for land sold. If you want to revisit the treaties, bring it on. We got lawyers now. <laughs> <laughs> With regard to the so-called cultural competency, it's not as simple as like a to-do a to-do list or a protocol worksheet or referring things to someone else. But it's knowing something about your students, your community members, um, the people that you're talking to, knowing something about the many different kinds of cultural experiences that they might have. Even in a place like Grand Portage, there, there's a diversity of faith traditions. Some people are very serious Catholics. Some are Episcopalians. Some follow traditional Ojibwe religious beliefs, and they're all living in the same place. Identity is complex. And then sometimes we forget that the emotional trust bank account might start with a negative balance. And we haven't even opened our mouth yet or done anything wrong. And that has to do with other people's history and systems and other things like that. And so sometimes we have to remember what we see when we meet someone, that's tip of the iceberg. There's all that stuff below the surface. And sometimes slower is faster. And sometimes we have to make some deposits before we can collect some dividends. And that could mean with emotional capital, you know, mobilizing for collective action, um, all kinds of things. All right. It's good to bring in multiple perspectives. But we can't expect them all to resonate. You can't be like, oh, you're from Grand Portage. So uh, have, have you been ricing yet this year? You know? Maybe they're from Grand Portage and lived there their whole life and they've never been harvesting wild rice. Maybe they have. You know? In a place like this, a lot of people do do woodsy things, but it's not a guarantee. Half of the enrolled tribal citizenry lives off res. 70% of the self-identified native population lives off reservation. So reservations are an important part of the native experience, but they're not the only part of the native experience. Hennepin County, Twin Cities, has one of the highest native populations in the state. So it's good to bring in those perspectives. We can't always expect them to resonate. Um, it's good to invite community members or students or whatever to share their perspectives. So if they're like, hey, I wanna talk about what my family did when we went out wild racing, awesome. But we can't put people on the spot and make them do it because maybe they'll feel ashamed or called out. And so you want to have, hold open space but not impose it. Um, it's good to be sensitive to different learning traits. I remember when I was a kid, my mom would bring me to storytelling and, um, and she'd say, look, that elder's telling stories. Put your head down, be respectful and listen. 
I'd go to school and teachers say, hey, look at me when I'm talking to you, be respectful. <laughs> you know, sometimes you get things like that, but that doesn't mean everyone's had that experience. Yeah, so you might just have different, different things with different folks. Native people have transformed the world in so many different ways. It's kind of a separate talk to look at all of the ways Native people have had tremendous impacts on the world that we all live in. Foods are one that are kind of easy and obvious. Imagine Italian food absent the tomato. There goes the lasagna, the spaghetti, the pizza, the Mediterranean diet. It came from Native people. Corn, that's in almost everything we eat. Potatoes, a staple of Irish food, so much so when there's a blight on the potatoes, two million people from Ireland come to America. How ironic is that? <laughs> you know? Chocolate, vanilla. So even if you're working with little kids, there are all kinds of ways to speak to an empowered contribution from many different kinds of people. When you look at the creation of American democracy, Franklin and Jefferson studied the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois Confederacy, and democracy, kind of like modern music, has many different roots. The ancient Greeks did voting. Plato wrote about this in the Republic, right? The ancient Romans developed a Senate. Even when you go to the Twin Cities, out here where the forest meets the prairies, you've got a Roman-inspired Senate. The building itself, even, right? And then also, Jefferson and Franklin were thinking about what was going on with the Haudenosaunee which had been initially five tribes, a sixth tribe joined later on, but they'd been fighting each other terribly. They decided to make peace. They bundled their implements of war together and buried them at the, pace, at the base of a great pine tree. This is where we get the American saying to bury the hatchet. And from then on, they were at peace. Each maintained their own distinct language and culture, but had a shared political confederation and made decisions about even things like going to war together. Well, once that happened, Jefferson and Franklin are studying that and saying, could we model this to use these Greco-Roman ideas about democracy and have independent colonies or states that are part of a united polity? And so initially they didn't even call this country the United States, they called it these United States. Mm -hmm. Granted, one of the motivations was how can we have slave owning states united in a nation with, you know, abolitionist thinking states? But that gave birth to America. Now, two years later, you got the French Revolution, which models its structure off of the American system. I just came from Switzerland. You know, I think they have 46 different, they call them Canada <laughs> provinces that are part of the United Polity. And this system was replicated around the world. So there is a powerful native thread in modern democracy that most people are oblivious to. And it's another way to speak, not just about tragedy, trauma, and loss, but about the empowered contributions native people have made to the rest of the world. And by the way, this is also one of those things that's tricky terrain sometimes. Like on the one hand, we do want to acknowledge problems and disparities and things like that. And on the other hand, we don't want to only amplify that and exclude all of the resiliency contributions and everything else that people have made. By the way, a group like the Ojibwe, who have never lost a major military confrontation ever, are constantly messaged that you are the ones who lost the wars. That's how come you got a little reservation in the northeast corner of Minnesota. It's not even accurate. But it's this kind of defeatist victimization narrative that then gets internalized. 87% of the educational standards that have anything to do with fate of anything have to do with something from before 1900. And it's a story of tragedy, trauma, and loss. All right? So we got work to do to just broaden out 
and render more truthful the narratives that we are sharing with people. There were tragedies and there were traumas and there were losses. And there were contributions to the rest of the world and empowerments. And it's not by accident that native people in Minnesota kept land on all of the 10 largest lakes in the state of Minnesota. They had to work hard to do that in very difficult times. All right, some pictures of my dad who wasn't native at all. He was an Austrian Jewish immigrant and a Holocaust survivor. Spoke nothing but German the first 13 years of his life. He has an amazing story of his own and I won't have time to take you deep into it, but uh, got out at age 13, some months after the Anschluss, the German annexation of Austria. Um, he, eventually both of his parents and two cousins survived. Everyone else was killed, some few hundred family members. And at age 14, made it to America. At age 17, lied about his age, enlisted in the US Army. He wanted to go kill Nazis, but they sent him to the Pacific Theater. He was stationed in the, <laughs> in the Philippines. And eventually, he made his way to Minnesota, met my mom, and here I am. <laughs> my mom grew up in the little village of Bina, part of the Leech Lake Reservation, population 400. If you're driving across Highway 2, don't blink or you miss it. Half of them are my cousins, that's <laughs> without exaggeration. My relatives have been buried, buried in the same place longer than America has been a country. Oh. Of course, now, you know, actually, they just shifted this up. The tribe acquired the cemetery. You used to have to go to a white resort owning family to purchase a funeral plot to be buried next to our ancestors. <laughs> when all of our use of that space had predated any of that, it's just weird. Yeah. Wow. But that has actually been remedied. When my mom was growing up, I think she had a pretty visceral experience with poverty hunting, fishing, gathering wild rice. That was less cool cultural pastime and more necessary means of survival. They'd pull all the kids from school for a couple of weeks during rice season. And, uh, cause they had to help with food production. She only met one professional native person ever her entire childhood. That was the school nurse. And she thought, you know, maybe I can do that. And so she went to nursing school. And one of her first jobs was working for the tribe's health program and she thought wow native people are really getting pushed around i'm going to do something about that and uh, she went on and got a law degree and she was the first female native attorney in the state of minnesota i think it was quite formative for me she didn't really explain things she just would bring me with her to work and i'd be sitting there in court watching and she'd be the only woman in court and she'd be the only native person in court and I remember walking out of there thinking, you know what? We can do stuff. And I think in her experience, and in my experience, you can just see the power and importance of role models. It's one of the reasons why the D and the DEI matters, representation. We need to see men and women doing awesome, cool things. And we do need to see people from different racial groups represented doing awesome, cool things. Mm -hmm. And that helps us believe we can do it too. Now, I sometimes hesitate to show you something like this. It's got some economic data on Bina. My internet search, by the way, pulled up somebody's fish house and nice SUV, <laughs> which I thought was ironic, so I just left that there. But <laughs> the economic data is uh, kind of sobering. One of the reasons I hesitate to show it is it can serve to reinforce one of the stereotypes about Native people, which says we're all living in squalor on a reservation. In a state like Minnesota, in 16 counties, tribes are not big employers, but the biggest employers of all. Be nice to Natives, you'll probably end up working for one someday. And about 50% of Native kids live below the poverty line. Both of those things are true. By the way, you know, if you um, look at economic data on white people in America, you will also see tremendous disparities. So one of the questions that sometimes comes up is how come those casino natives aren't solving poverty for all those other natives? 
And that's like saying, how come those white people on New York's <laughs> Upper East Side aren't solving poverty for poor white people in rural Appalachia? Really? Well, who says they're not? And we have complex systems that govern people's lives, political, economic, and all kinds of other things. Also, there's a great TED talk, by the way, um, this Nigerian literary figure, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie has, The Danger of a Single Story. So some of you have seen that. And uh, I think among the great things she shares is the problem of stereotypes. It's not so much that they're incorrect as much as they're incomplete. And they can give you a narrow single story and leave you with that to understand the experience of a whole group of people. So if you did study white people in America, a lot of people do, and you only, you only looked at, you know, poverty in rural white Appalachia and thought, white people, man, what's happened to the white family? Oh, it's terrible. That wouldn't tell you everything you need to know about the white experience in America. It wouldn't even tell you everything you need to know about the white experience in Appalachia. Similarly, if you only looked at the white experience in New York's Upper East Side and thought, talk about everything handed on a silver platter, whoo. That wouldn't tell you everything you need to know about the white experience in America either. But if you study white people in America, you don't get a single story. You get many stories. You can watch the movies and there are stories about, you know, white people who are good guys and white people who are bad guys and white people who are good guys breaking bad. There's a whole series about that. White people <laughs> who are bad guys turning good. Check out Jamie Lannister in Game of Thrones. And as a result, you don't have the single story, you have many, many stories. So you can watch Psycho or the series adaptation Bates Motel and you're not like, white people, run, <laughs> right? But if you're gonna study Native Americans, you're gonna see more movies about aliens than Native Americans. And even though this is starting to change, there's so many more Native people writing books, there are Native people penetrating cinema, you know, and there are all kinds of new things that are coming out. This is evolving, but not thoroughly evolved. Oftentimes, even sympathetic shows like Dances with Wolves still have like good Natives and bad Natives. Good Natives in that one, the Lakota, bad ones, the Pawnee, and a white guy who's better at being Native than all the Natives, <laughs> you know, and those kinds of things. So evolving, but not evolved. And certainly some of the new stuff is much, much better. I saw big changes. So like when I was a hike, there was a time when we had a little house that didn't have electricity or running water. So we had outhouse, wash up in the creek in the summer and now the wash basins in the winter, buy a gallon of milk, tie a string on it, sink it in the creek because it was spring fed, kept it cool. And I never felt poor, I never had food insecurity. Those remain quite happy memories. But by the time I'd hit middle school, my mother had her law degree, built a nice house, economic profile for our family changed dramatically. And it, to me, revealed the power of an education. <clears throat> we know, and the data supports this, as well as the anecdotal information that if you haven't finished high school, you will earn one tenth of the amount of money than somebody who has a terminal degree on average. Now, you can still finish college and end up working at, you know, job loose. It doesn't guarantee you an outcome, but it is a lever that improves your chances of access to opportunity. By the way, most people with a terminal degree marry someone with a terminal degree, so you get a 20 fold difference in earnings power by family with compound interest. <laughs> every year over an entire lifetime and the ability to transfer the wealth to the next generation. So wealth will naturally self-perpetuate, which means the poverty will too. And right now, 60% of students of color in America finish high school. 50% of native kids finish high school. If we had perfect equity today, of course we don't, but pretend we did, our educational system alone would engineer racially predictable financial disparities. Yes. 
And we're still doing this kind of education for assimilation stuff. And then wondering why it's not having the same kind of traction with this particular community, right? So there are all kinds of things related to that to work on. There's my crew. I know it's never dull. There are nine kids. It's a big, beautiful, blended family. We're starting to get into the grandbaby business. And here's my wife in the middle of the pile. She's got blonde hair, blue eyes. She's from the Swedish American tribe. <laughs> yeah, somebody's getting along out there. If I hold up my finger and say, what is this? I might start a fight unless we clarify in what language. Because in the language of body parts, it's a finger. But in the language of numbers, well, that's a one. In the language of space, up. So who's right? And of course, they're all right. It's a matter of language, perspective, context. But all too often, when we have a tough topic like coronavirus, race relations, somebody's up there saying this, here's a finger, it's not an elbow, it's not a toe, the rest of you, shh. Mm -hmm. And someone else is listening going, what? It's a one, not a two, see? They just don't understand. They totally miss each other. But if we can see that as a one and a finger and up, that's the multiple perspectives, can be so helpful. By the way, great advice if you ever want to have a friend or be in a marriage or work in a workplace of more than two people, you're not always going to see everything the same way. You could be married to somebody for 50 years in a row and they will still take you by surprise and give you something to argue about. So instead of shouting them down, saying, you're so wrong, you don't know what you're talking about, it's so much more powerful and effective to say, I'm sorry, you seem to be experiencing this so differently than me. Can you help me understand? Why do you feel like that? What would be a better way that I could communicate to you around this so we can, whatever, go on vacation or whatever? You know, so with all the things, Instead of doubling down and being defensive on one perspective, looking for the multiple perspectives and being curious can be very helpful. Feels like yesterday. <laughs> so we experience this world so differently. For starters, we both live in rural northern Minnesota. We both like to go for a run. Now, when I go for a run, I'm like, the sun is shining. The birds are singing. This is awesome. I don't really feel unsafe. I mean, there are people texting and driving, you know, but I'm on the side of the road and I can get out of the way if somebody's really getting crazy. Once in a very great while, somebody will slow down and give me a mean look and I'm like, eh, you know, but for the most part, I'm just like beautiful Northern Minnesota. Here we go. Now when my wife goes for a run, she has a very different experience. So if somebody slows down to give her a good look or pulls over to the side of the road, deal with your cell phone like you're supposed to, sometimes her heart starts to race and she's like, oh my God, could this be a sexual assault? What's my escape plan? Should I run in the woods? Should I go back now? Why did I come for a run? I could have just gone on the treadmill. And so the data says she's not as safe as me doing the same thing as me. Mm -hmm. My many conversations with her reveal she never feels quite as safe as me doing the same thing as me. That experience is not enough to stop her from going for a run. She still goes. And it's not just because she's stubborn. <laughs> There's a little risk reward trade off. And so she usually goes, right? But what the data and her experiences do is they, they kind of tax the enjoyment she gets from that experience. Not enough to stop her from doing it, but it just means she's not as safe and she's not going to have quite the same exuberance that I will. Now, I happen to be a nice guy. I work at universities. I've actually been working in my current job for like 23 years now. I went fast. And uh, I've 
chaired um, search committees where we're bringing in new employees a number of times. And I'm actually quite proud that on every committee that I have chaired, women have been at least half the people on the committee by intention. It's like I'm trying to do the things, but whether I like it or not, whether I want it or not, whether I'm oblivious or not, I still get to be safer when I'm going for a run. And if I'm oblivious to it, no one's going to shout me down, shame me out. There's no punishment or consequence. Right? This is an unearned benefit and advantage. Mm -hmm. Right. But our contexts shift and change all the time. So when we get into cars, it's kind of like roles reverse. She can be cruising 43 and a 30, which to be honest, is kind of normal for her. Driving kids to school. <laughs> Pop on the corners like, lady, keep it down. She's never been pulled over and never had a citation. I am a buddy Dougie professor dude. I'm not wearing my nerd glasses now, but I've got them and I'm wearing those when I drive. And I actually do drive the speed limit and I've been pulled over this isn't an exaggeration, about 40 times. Mm -hmm. oh. I was pulled over last week. I was pulled over a month ago. Mm -hmm. I was pulled over twice in the past I guess, couple of years for no seatbelt while wearing a seatbelt in broad daylight. <laughs> Officer, I, I am wearing a seatbelt. Oh, you are now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, twice I've had cops pull guns. Ooh including in a routine traffic stop in a minivan with a, my kid is a middle school honor student bumper sticker with the kids in the car in the broad daylight. Comes to the window unholstered. Know why I pulled you over? No, oh, sir. Clock you four miles over the limit. Oh. Like you need a gun for that, you know. We have a big blended family, so I have kids from previous uh, relationship. Some Blair and I, Went camping for the first time with a bunch of kids with us. And I get pulled over. And the cop, you know, says license and registration, hand him all that stuff that's in the visor. And then he says, How do you spell that last name? How do you pronounce that last name? What's your last name? Do you own this car? Who owns this car? It's like weird questions, you know, starts going off like it's a Honda, you know, like didn't steal it. And uh, but I wouldn't say that, you know. Then he's like, get out. And I'm thinking, uh. I have a protection from unreasonable searches and seizures. You need probable cause. There's no probable cause. But if I say that, he's really going to give me a hard time. So fine, no problem. So we'll go back to the trunk. He's like, open it. and starts going through all the camping gear. You know, windows are open. It's a little cold. The kids start crying. And he says, you wait right here. He goes up. Man, are you okay? Are you sure you're okay? You know, and starts giving her questions like that. And she's like, yeah, I'm fine. And you know, finally, we're sitting there for like 45 minutes. And then he hands us stuff back and says, have a good day. Mm -hmm. Half an hour later, got all the camping gear packed in there, take off. And I'm like, so Blair, are you sure you want to be with me? Because <laughs> this is not the last time that this is going to happen. And it hasn't just been me. It's like all of our kids have been pulled over too. And I don't know if it's a thing in patriarchy, viewing women as property. And here's a pretty blonde girl with a dark guy. He's stealing my property kind of thing or what's going on. But there have been not just isolated incidents, but such a pattern that there is something going on. And with some things like Airline pilots. You don't get to be wrong and crash the plane, right? Like Delta can't be like 90% of our flights make it. <laughs> you know what I mean? They all have to make it. You gotta be right like all the time. And with life and death things like police work, gotta be right all the time. You don't get to be like, there's a few bad apples. Or there's a pattern 
that renders people less safe. By the way, like I'm friends with our chief of police, Mike Mastin, he's awesome. He comes to our courageous conversations about race. He put Ojibwe language signage on the cop cars. Here it is, Gunawanja Gang Minawa Nadama Gang to protect and serve. Believes in community policing. He's doing a lot of great things. His team still pulled me over 40 times. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that makes this stuff tough to talk about, if we say, like, one of the things that makes us tough to talk about is we are so steeped in the culture of individualism, right? What are my individual accomplishments? What are my degrees? What are my credentials? What's my job? What's my resume look like? What's my last name? Make sure that goes on my kids. You know, it's, we're very focused on individualism and we're very competitive about it. Like how many sports where nobody wins and nobody loses? Yeah. <laughs> Yoga? We'll probably have yoga competitions soon. You know, how many board games where nobody wins and nobody loses? And there actually are some where like everybody gets off the sinking islands together and nobody does. But for the most part, I'm like whooping the kid's butt at chess and I'm crushing them at risk. And, you know, we're very competitive and individualistic. As a result, those two things kind of go together. Then when we say there's a problem with something like sexism or any of the isms, we say there's a problem with sexism, then a lot of men, because of the individualism filter, start thinking, well, if there's sexism, there has to be a sexist. If they're not looking at themselves, they have to be looking at me. Wait a minute, I'm a good guy. You don't know me. But maybe we're not saying you have individual sexist malice in your heart and you are trying to oppress women we're saying you get to be safer when you go for a run and we want women to be safe in that experience too the system delivers sexism mm -hmm. not your individual behavior although we shouldn't evaluate our individual behaviors too mm -hmm. when we say there's a problem with racism People start thinking if there's racism, there has to be a racist. If they're not looking at themselves, they must be looking at me. Wait a minute, I'm a good person. You don't know me. But maybe we're not saying you have individual racial malice in your heart and you are trying to keep people of color in an oppressed condition. We're simply saying that there are patterns, policies, or procedures that are rendering people of color less safe. We don't get to live as long as everybody else. Whoa. And we want to do something about that. So instead of stopping the conversation, saying we can't talk about that, or I'm going to walk away from it. You know, the oppression of the woke, you know, or whatever, that I need to try to understand what these other experiences are and then evaluate what are the policies, procedures, and practices that are making things less safe for whole groups of people. And the context shifts, right? So my wife's less safe going for a run, I'm less safe going for a drive. Is it sexism or racism? It is both. And all the other isms, there are all kinds of them. They intersect with each other. We're shifting between them all the time. And it's so hard to see. When I go for a run, I can just be lost in the moment. There aren't flashing lights. You were just given a pass because you're a dude. Nobody's checking you out. You know, I'm just like, beautiful day. Right? When my wife's going for a drive and not getting pulled over, there's no flashing sign that says, you were just not racially profiled today. Have a good one. You know, she's just like, this is normal. Mm. And so as a result, we're all like fish. We can see everything in our environment perfectly, except for the glass bowl that confines us. And here we are swimming along, having a good day, and we're doing our best on community bridge building and bonk. How come most people are mad at me? I didn't do anything wrong. Right? We run into the glass wall. 
And so to navigate, we need some sonar. Sonar is sound waves going out and sound waves coming back. It's a constant conversation with all the many different kinds of stakeholders and community members and groups and everything else. So we can try to visualize something that we don't experience the same way. I have to try to visualize my wife's experience going for a run, even though I'll never experience it the same way as her. And try to empathize and try also to take actions that would be meaningful. Sometimes I don't know how to act. I'm like, I'm sorry, like, what can I do? And it's not her burden to have all the answers for me about how to make her safer going for a run. But if I'm listening and understanding, trying when there are opportunities or when we try to create opportunities, maybe there's a community action effort around lighting on running trails or whatever. Okay, I'm with you on that. I'll actually go to the town hall meeting with you on that and we'll say, we'll speak your truth, you know, or whatever it happens to be. So a lot of times, even though these are the dynamics, it's important to be aware of our human psychology. We are prone to individualism and to defensiveness around our individual character. That makes it hard when we are in mixed company to validate someone else's truth and experience. And then if we're not even showing up to the meeting because we feel like we might get picked on for the sins of our ancestors, then it's harder to mobilize for collective action around any of the isms. So one of the kinds of work, you know, is reaching out to the people who don't want to get beat up by the sins of their ancestors and don't want to go to the meeting because they think that's what it's all about and say, why don't you come with me? It's not what you think. And let's see what we can learn together. And I'm going to explain a little bit about how I see things. And those conversations can help keep people willing to experience the discomfort so you can do stuff. And then of course, we need to understand all the systems, policies, procedures, and other things. So as an example, this is just a kid in the foster care system going to school in Texas. And they got a letter from the school that said, um, all boys who attend public school in Seminole, Texas need a haircut above the collar. So get your kid's haircut while enroll in school. And the foster parents said, well, we don't even have permanent placement of this kid. This is an important part of their culture. Uh, if we cut his hair, it might be considered assault. This could traumatize him, but it's compulsory that he attend school. So what do you want us to do? So the school writes back, if you can prove that he's an enrolled member of a federally recognized tribe and authenticate that this is an important part of their religion, we can use the religious part to petition the school board for a variance, which they did. Oh. Yeah. And so the point is not so much, let's all write letters to Seminole, Texas right now. The point is, <laughs> although by all means, but, <laughs> but the point is this, there probably wasn't someone in the school district thinking, how can we pass a regulation to make life harder for native kids? No. They're probably thinking short hair is normal. They're probably thinking we had problems with bullying before. And if all the boys have similar kinds of haircuts, it's one less thing for them to bully each other over. This will make life easier for them and us. It's something like that, probably. So a lot of times our systems, policies, and procedures, we just think things are normal, like having a democratic process when you assemble a committee and don't realize that it can have an effect on people. So this is where we need the sonar, the sound waves going out to help me understand what I don't see. Um, what would the best process be for this? What would the best kind of regulation be here? Um, you know, I'm open to your ideas. Please share them. We have ways to share them where you can share anonymously or in mixed company. We want to dig into this. You know, that kind of stuff can be very helpful and empowering as we uh, as we start going forward. All right. Famous picture in the racial equity world. You've probably seen this in different iterations. So here, you know, standing on the boxes, that's me going for a run. 
down in the pit, that's my wife going for a run. Or when the context shifts, there's my wife going for a drive and there's me going for a drive, right? So these contexts can shift. If we have a, we're so fair, we treat everybody the same approach, which is very American, everybody gets similar supports, right? But that doesn't always remedy the inequity. Not everyone can see the game or play or be equally compensated for the same efforts. If you give people different kinds of supports and try to level things out a little bit, that can improve the experience for a time, but it doesn't address the fact that something is so messed up that you need to give different kinds of supports to different people. So that's where the language sometimes shifts to a justice-based approach. What would it look like to change the environment to kick that fence down altogether? I think it's important too to acknowledge that this stuff freaks people out. <laughs> These are images from over 100 years ago when the women's suffrage movement was coming to fruition. And it's ridiculous, right? It's so ridiculous. But a lot of men were terrified that if women get the right to vote and worse yet, enter the workforce, they will be taking jobs from men they will be taking political power from men and women will be oppressing men. We will flip roles between who is the oppressed and who is the oppressor. Let's go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so there was all this energy exerted to resist what today would seem like the most common sense equity based change. Of course, women should vote and be able to enter the workforce and so forth. With hindsight, we know women did get the right to vote. Even today, 17% of the democratically elected leaders in the world are women. Patriarchy is alive and well. And when women entered the workforce, the stock market went up like crazy, as did standard of living and household incomes and things like that. And men were the primary owners of stocks and bonds and the primary financial beneficiaries of women entering the workforce. This was totally ridiculous. But the fear felt very real at the time. Today, there's a fear that if people of color rise, they will be sitting on the white people, oppressing them. Even South Africa, after the dismantling of apartheid, after Mandela, white people still dominate the positions of economic power, police authority, and military power throughout the country, and still have a predominantly white national rugby team, culturally, <laughs> are doing fine, you know? But that was the fear. A lot of Americans have this, like we're gonna, people of color will be oppressing white people. White people will be victimized, you know? But the reality is quite different. Much like the women's suffrage movement, if people of color rise and everybody finishes high school and goes to college and finishes college and gets a job, that just means everybody's a load-bearing citizen paying taxes <laughs> and more fully humanized. And I mean, I, I am coming for everything my ancestors were denied. But that shouldn't freak anybody out. Because by that, I mean, I want to live a long life. And if I get longevity, that will not reduce anybody else's longevity. If I get equal rights, that will not reduce anybody else's rights. If your neighbor's house value goes up, yours does too, right? We all do better when we all do better. And I think that's an important reminder. I, I don't think we should shout people down when they have the fears. You can say, I understand that you have some fear and some angst about this. Tell me more, help me understand. Can I share a little about this? 
And a lot of the fear, anxiety, shaming stuff starts to evaporate when we shine a little light on it. And it's important that we build bridges across some of those experiences. Now, I'm, I realize I'm bumping up against the clock and I eventually have to get to the National Monument, but what I'll, I'll do, I'll mention just a couple, couple things here. There's some really exciting things I've seen happening in education and in other spaces. Um, it is a testy time. We're seeing statues coming down. We're seeing rewritings of all kinds of things. You know, it's a, uh, and there's pushback. Uh, our politics are as testy as they have ever been, but I'm full of hope. Oftentimes there's a great disturbance right on the verge of a progressive surge. It's often been this way in American history. Uh, and we saw like the civil rights movement was hardly comfortable times, but some good things came out of it. And we've seen the same thing at other iterations right before that you had McCarthyism and you know all kinds of stuff and then we we broke out it's been a bit of a pendulum swinging back and forth but kind of like the stock market it's like you get ups and downs but the long trajectory over time is up so that's like the Martin Luther King quote where you know arc of history is long but it bends toward justice that doesn't mean that it all happens all by itself. Yeah, we have to work hard and engineer these things. And the longer we take and the slower it goes, the more people suffer needlessly with all of our various oppressions. So I've been excited to see the expeditionary model, which among other things will show that students can exhibit knowledge in many ways. Teachers can ask big guiding questions they don't have to pick sides in a cultural debate and all perspectives are welcome. So I have kids, some of my kids are going to an expeditionary school and I've seen some remarkable things coming out of it. I'm just gonna move quickly through this part. I've seen some work done with the integrated curricular approach, which is pretty exciting too. Um, here, we naturally do this with the youngest children, but even with the older ones, like if we take at Wadukadati, maybe they'll take the whole school to harvest wild rice and they'll like how much rice can you fit in a canoe? Rectangle, triangle, another triangle, fill it full of water, pour into cylinders, double check our measurements, maybe tobacco offering, harvest the rice. Little kids are studying the life cycle of a plant. Older kids are doing water tension level measurements, bring the rice back. Maybe there's their music unit where they're parching and jigging rice, dancing on it. Uh, and then they, have their health unit and this is a superfood and what's the caloric content for a serving and its nutritional value and the kids have a feast and take some home to their families they do extension activities and say all right if this is a staple food how much would one person eat in a year uh you know and then if on this reservation there are five main communities 523 here 720 there and so forth and how much collectively would they harvest in a year Let's do some graphing exercises. Some years the yield is higher, some years the year it's lower. How much would you need to harvest every year to maintain this population? And the kids are like, wow, our ancestors did that? And the teacher's mm -hmm. like, no, you just, you just did that. And all of a sudden there's a relevancy for the math and the science curriculum and other things. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing some innovative and cool things going on with some of these different approaches. Um, and I think... You know, for all of us, this applies to not just educational space, but also to our community development and healing efforts. A couple of things that might be important to remind you of, you can check out the Desmond Tutu book. Uh, he worked with in the South African, he has a bunch of books out, um, the Book of Forgiving. Uh, but he won a Nobel Peace Prize for his work in the dismantling of apartheid and the truth and reconciliation effort there. But among the things he says is that, when there's been an injury, could be an individual who injures another individual or the collective ones. We need to hold space for the telling of the story and the receiving of the story. And that this is a very important part of the healing process. And if we don't hold space for that messy, emotional sharing of story, that what happens is 
a lot of the healing gets suppressed and bottled up and it wants to spill out. And so sometimes you have a community meeting and you just want to talk about economic development or the school and someone wants to talk about residential boarding schools. In a way, what they're saying is, I need you to hear this story and receive this story. And sometimes that lets enough steam out of the bag where then they're ready to lean in on the logic-based solutions everyone wanted to talk about. So this is part of the awareness piece. Everybody needs to have their identity, a chance to learn about themselves as well as the rest of the world. The Hawaiians have been masters at this stuff. It's pretty amazing to me. They're, their language was illegal for use in public schools 30 years ago. It's one of the official languages for the state now. And uh, they've made remarkable gains. So we're trying to do that in our space too. I'll just share one last story with you. Um, I think my mom had a lot of questions because my youngest brother's a medical doctor who we considered a loser, by the way. <laughs> and my sister's got a law degree. She's a judge now. My other brother and I have PhDs. People would always ask her, how did you do that? Like straight out of Vina. And she says, I have no idea. <laughs> All I know is I really value education. And I don't just mean from books. I made sure they got to go out in the woods. They got exposure to their language and culture. It makes all the difference in the world. Nothing can stop a native person who knows who they are. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's actually true for all of our kids of all backgrounds, to know who they are as well as learn about the rest of the world. It's a tremendous gift. So as we look for ways to engineer that, both in systems like schools, but more broadly in our community, I, th I think we're gonna be able to do some real good and, and really build uh, the bridge. Another thing too, all of the isms are so dehumanizing, not just for the victims, they're dehumanizing for all of us. We all need healing and we all need liberation from all of those isms. So I like the Lila Watson quote, she's an Australian Aboriginal educator and activist. And she said, if you come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you come because your liberation is tied up with mine, then let us work together. Oh. So with that, I wanna say miigwech. Thank you for your kind time and attention. Thank you for your kind time and attention. Sorry you had a man bun view for a lot of it, but uh, I'm glad that you're all here. And you can advise me, Kelsey, on time. Do I have time for a few questions? You know what? It's about all the drive time. So I'd say give yourself an hour to get up to Grand Portage. Okay. And when does, do you know, my next one starts at noon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, we so I've got about 15. Yeah. Okay. So why don't we do this? Break, shuffle, grab some coffee. I'm happy to field a few questions. And then I'll just mill around on the side there if anyone's interested in books and stuff like that. All right. Thanks so much for coming out. What a great baby. Yeah, right? Yeah, awesome. She ate right now. All right. Did anyone have questions or comments? Just for a couple minutes. What your, what your conversation with Mike, the police chief, is like when you see him after you have been pulled up? Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, you could probably guess, don't like hold back on my stories and stuff, but I'm not mean spirited as I share that. And so he will often shake his head and go, oh, that shouldn't have happened. You know? But I think honestly to him, it's, it's a couple bad actors. And it's harder for him to see practices, policies, procedures, and systems. Because um, to him, the good guys, you know, and I think that's pretty common, and I wouldn't fault him for it. I think cops are good guys, too. Their lives on the line every dang day to keep us safe. I don't think it's bad individuals. I mean, there are, you know, chauvins in the world, no doubt. But at the same time, we do have these kinds of patterns. And so usually I try to steer the conversation to other things we can do around that. Like 
And I realized every journey has to start with the first step. So he's trying to take the steps, like the language thing, you know. Um, he's like, you want to come with me for a ride along? Tell me what you see. You know, he's, he's actually asking stuff like that. And I, I think that sets a good tone. Um, I've been pretty impressed, like even in Canada, you know, there's a lot of advocacy on missing and murdered Indigenous women. And a lot of times the police organizations will sponsor the fundraiser and they're there dishing out the spaghetti feed to the community and things like that. And I think that also sends a message. Um, I think, you know, a lot of it too is just being aware in a lot of our fields, social services, police work, so many things, there's a lot of discretion, right? So if we did stop and frisk in college dorm rooms, the newspaper headlines would be about the epidemic of middle-class white drug abuse rather than what's happening in, in you know, communities of color. Because most of those kids have a dime bag of pot sitting in their room. You know what I mean? But we provide a lot of discretionary attention in the communities of color. And that's also something that can drive the disparities. So, you know, I think there is, it's, it's an uneven attentioning. Um, like if you gave $10 million to a police organization, they might spend it on military hardware rather than training for the team, but not everywhere and not in equal measure. And I think it's been a wake up call, especially after the murder of George Floyd. Like some people are actually serious about things like defunding the police, you know, or abolish. And if an organization won't evolve, you get the revolution or reform response. If it won't reform, it'll be a revolution. And it sounds crazy to most people, like, but we need police to answer 911 calls, you know, like, yes, you do. But uh, it can be any number of organizations answering any number of different kinds of calls. So you filter the calls and you send social services or you send whoever. Um, and I think that stuff is causing a wake up call. So I'm seeing more training. I'm seeing people showing up and acting differently. Um, every conversation matters though. And, you know, it's a tough time to be a police officer. Mm -hmm. They feel besieged and beset and unappreciated and disrespected, you know, and sometimes they are, you know? Yeah. But people of color feel like their lives are on the line in ways and on a level that it should not be. Mm -hmm. And that they should not have to endure that for someone else's comfort. You know, and that's the tension. How do you communicate around that? Bridge build around that, mobilize for action around that. And it takes some real patience and fortitude with the discomfort to get to the point where you have a really productive conversation. Mm -hmm. But when you get there, you get some really great things done. Yeah. All right. Maybe one or two more, and then I'll we'll have to yeah. shuffle. Okay. Um, so I, it was interesting to hear you talk about learning from kids because that's what I do all the time now because I'm an eight year old and she's yes very much in her ask questions where I feel like I needed three PhDs to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, she rocked me and my husband both back on our heels a few months ago. We were at the powwow at Rendezvous Days and. Um, she was imitating the dancers, you know, because she's a kid, she sees things, she imitates. And my husband said something about, like, I'm not totally sure if that's polite. And she asked why. And, and, I, and I said, you know, well, because some things are special to a culture and not everything is always for sharing. Um, and, and I just don't know what the etiquette is here. And that seemed fine. And then she started crying a few minutes later. Oh. I asked, what's wrong? And she said, well, mommy, I feel like we don't have anything that's special to our culture. And my husband and I both were just kind of like, uh, well, yeah. I kind of feel that way too. And we I, it kind of just, it kind of just stayed there. I didn't really have an answer for her. But I was curious what your thoughts on were on, because I've been thinking ever since that about how 
whiteness is so much defined by what it isn't. And it, as a cultural identity, white is sort of like, what's the content of that other than supremacy of power? Um, and uh, and I don't know, I'm just curious to see what that conversation might have looked like for you um, with a kid going, well, what is white culture? I mean, no. Yeah. Yeah, this, you are not alone wrestling with this. <laughs> yeah, my wife wrestles with this. Yeah, but let's got all this cool stuff to share with our children. I don't know what I got, you know, <laughs> and and uh, some of it has to do with the history of like how European countries, nation states, and religious institutions have evolved. You know, a lot, and you have it's exactly that. You have a lot of institutions that have taken over spiritual practice, right? Yeah. So, for example. The Catholic Church would set Easter on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the it's also, you know, like because that would be a pagan rite. Mm -hmm. So then when all the pagans are ready to celebrate, it's a Catholic event. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? So it was, it was done intentionally, like co-opting, and then of course you got all the inquisitions and everything else, you know. And so as a result, a lot of people have had to go through the institutions to access what might have been you go back like all of us humans just 10,000 years ago had earth-based worldviews lived in villages had a strong sense of community you know had customs and rituals that were both individual and communal about rites of passage coming of age um, celebrating harvests all these different kinds of things and a lot of that has been so colonized through the institutions, the political or the religious ones, that a lot of people struggle. Now, I, I have friends who are Catholic who are like, feel the hand of God when they're doing mass and like, it really has genuine meaning for them. And I've also met a lot of people who feel like it does not. Uh, and so there isn't a simple handbook on like, here's what to do. But honestly, it's like that for everybody. Indigenous people, too. Sometimes there's this perception that, you know, beautiful, rich culture right at your fingertips. There is a beautiful, rich culture, but it's sometimes hard even for our own people to access and do all of those things. Mm -hmm. And it does take intentional intention to rebuild and reconstruct some of those things. Mm -hmm. I've, you know, met people like, I don't know, Joy DeGruis, great book post-traumatic slave syndrome, who has this experience. She goes back to Lesotho and was talking to elders and introduced herself as an African-American woman and had this big translation meltdown for about half an hour over the label because <laughs> no one understood the term. Yeah. And they said, no, what, what they're saying is that you're not African-American, you're African. You're one of the lost ones. You've been gone for a few hundred years. Welcome home. You know, and she's crying and hugging everybody and, you know, has this kind of cathartic reconnection experience. And I've had white friends who've gone back to Ireland and had something quite similar. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, we have been so focused on individualism and materialism mm -hmm. that we forget about connection, community, history, even learning about your who's in your family tree and what they did and all those different things and reconnecting to places can be very powerful and healing and positive. So um, yeah. good questions. I can tell there are more, but I do know you that. Yeah. 